Hello, I'm not Chuck. As some of you know, I have a lot of diverse interests, and one that goes back a long way is ham radio. I've been a licensed amateur radio operator for a very long time. My interest in it has waxed and waned over the years, but I have never abandoned the activity. Recently, my interest has been piqued by digital radio and by low power operation. I bought a kit for a low power digital transceiver and plan to get on the air with it operating in a mode called FT8. You may already know about FT8, but if not, I encourage you to Google it and read about it. If it interests you at all, you might want to order the same kit that I did and try your hand at putting it together and getting it on the air. If you have some experience soldering through hole components, the kit won't be hard to build with a couple of possible exceptions. First, there are a few coils that have to be wound on small toroids, and second, there are two surface-mounted integrated circuits that have to be hand-soldered. Neither is especially hard if you read the assembly instructions and you can see how it's done. That's where this video series comes in. I will show you how to do what the assembly manual tells you to do. There'll be three videos in the series. This is the first and details building the individual band modules. The second covers the main transceiver board and the third covers the optional variable frequency oscillator or VFO. You can download the assembly instructions from the QRP Guys website before you buy the kit. Read the manual, watch my videos, and then decide if you want to build a kit. Well, that's enough blah, blah, blah. Let's get started. The transceiver kit includes printed circuit boards and parts for three band modules, 40 meters, 30 meters, and 20 meters. All three modules are assembled the same way, just with different component values as spelled out on pages 8 and 9 of the QRP guy's instructions. Building the modules is pretty easy. The only real difficulties involve winding and installing the toroid coils, and that's not so hard once you understand the process. I'm going to assemble the 20 meter band module in this video and show you step by step how I wound the wires stripped the insulation, and mounted the finished toroid coils. After that, the rest of the build consists of mounting and soldering a few through-hole components and should be a piece of cake. I'll provide some photos and brief commentary on that process. To wind a toroid, you'll need the correct toroid, about 12 inches of 26 gauge enameled copper wire, and some sharp side cutters. I found a small pair of needle nose pliers to be helpful too. In this video, I'm winding L3 for the 20 meter band. It is supposed to use the yellow toroid with 15 turns of wire. Start by threading one end of the wire through the hole in the toroid. Leave enough wire hanging out to hold onto with your thumb. Grab the long part of the wire, pull it around the toroid, and feed the end through the toroid again. Wait just a minute, that's wrong. You did read the instructions and look at the drawings, didn't you? Okay, and let me show you the right way. Watch carefully. Did you see the difference? Look at the instructions again. Notice that the direction of the winding is specified and is shown in the drawing on the left. Watch as I finish the winding process. See how each turn starts by coming through the bottom of the toroid, exits out the top, goes to the right and back in through the bottom. You southpaws will have to adjust the instructions to suit yourselves, but the final product should be the same regardless of which hand you use for what. Pull each turn tight with your fingers as it comes out of the top. Every once in a while I gave the wire an extra tug by pulling the end with my needle nose pliers. If you try that, be sure to grab the wire near the end to avoid damaging the enamel insulation in the area that will be on the toroid.
try to leave a little space between each turn so that you can get your thumbnail or a plastic spudger in to adjust the spacing. Somehow I've gotten a kink near the end of my wire. Because it's close to the end, it won't be a problem, but if it had been on a turn, I would have stripped the whole winding out and started over. Keep going until you have the correct number of turns on the toroid. Don't forget that each time the wire goes through the hole, that counts as one turn. To be sure that you have exactly the correct number of turns, you might want to take a photo of the assembly and count the turns in the photo it is a lot easier. That tip, by the way, is from the QRP guys. Watch carefully as I arrange the ends of the wire so that they both point straight down. That's because the toroid will lay flat on the printed circuit board and the wire ends will have to pass straight down through the PCB in order to be soldered. Take a look at the band module parts placement drawing from page 7 on the assembly manual. Cut both wire ends so that they extend about 3 eighths of an inch below the bottom of the toroid. The toroid assembly is now ready for removing the insulation and tinning the wires before installation. Set it aside in a safe place. Removing the insulation from the ends of the coil can be done by scraping the wire ends with a sharp blade such as this, or by burning it off with hot solder. I've done it both ways and they both work, but frankly, I don't really like either one very much. Scraping the insulation involves pulling on the wire ends, scraping down the length of the wire end and then repeatedly moving the blade around the circumference of the wire and scraping some more in order to remove all the insulation. I worry that that scraping and tugging will damage the wire and cause it to break, although to be honest that's probably not really very likely. Burning the insulation off requires heating your soldering iron up to about 400 degrees Celsius, which is close to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Melting solder at that temperature creates a lot of smoke from the vaporized flux, and temperatures that high aren't really good for the life expectancy of the tip on your soldering iron. In the end, I decided that the hot solder method is what I would use and what I'm going to show in the video. If you decide to try it, wear some eye protection and take whatever precautions you believe are necessary to protect yourself from the smoke and whatever bad things it might contain. So here goes. The process is actually pretty simple. Melt a blob of solder on the iron and immerse the wire end in the molten solder. 
move the solder blob up and down the wire until the insulation is vaporized and the solder sticks to the exposed copper wire. The wire will then be silver colored. Try not to burn the insulation from the wire turns on the toroid, but ensure that all the wire that will be in the plated through hole on the PCB is well tinned. Before you try to solder the toroid coil to the PCB, it's a good idea to add some flux to the tinned wire ends. I use some Kester 186 liquid flux, but any good rosin flux will do. Of course, acid flux should never be used on electronics. Once you have the toroid coils properly wound and the wire ends tinned, place them both on the PCB. Don't forget that L2 and L3 are not identical and each one has its own dedicated spot on the printed circuit board. When they are correctly placed, turn the PCB over, solder all four wire ends and cut off the excess. I actually can solder better than it looks in the video. My excuse is that I didn't want to let my hands or my head block the camera. If you're watching closely, you may wonder about that solder joint at the lower right, and you are correct to do so. When I got it out from under the camera and looked it over, I thought it might be a cold solder joint, so I touched it up. Securing the toroid coils to the PCB is accomplished with tie wraps. Watch closely to see their correct orientation and routing. Take care not to damage the coil windings or the solder joints when tightening the tie wraps. Here is L2 with one tie wrap in place. The key thing to remember is that both tie wraps for each coil are inserted from the bottom of the PCB through the center of the toroid and then fastened on the bottom side of the PCB. Here is L2 with both tie wraps in place. Secure L3 in exactly the same way. Once all four tie wraps are secure, it's clear sailing ahead. In this photo, pin headers J5 and J6 have been soldered in place, as well as X1, the 14 MHz crystal. Notice the two pin header just below the crystal. There I have deviated from the QRP guy's instructions. The assembly guide says to install a wire jumper across the two pads immediately below the crystal, unless you're going to use the optional VFO, in which case you should leave off the wire jumper. Because I intend to use the crystal part of the time, and the VFO part of the time, I have installed the two-pin header. That way I can put a shorting block across the pins to use the crystal, and leave off the shorting block when I have the VFO installed. If your plan is to always use the crystal, then you might want to solder in the wire jumper. Here is the completed 20 meter module. The inductor has been installed just under the QRP guy's logo and all six capacitors have been soldered in place. 
be careful to double or maybe triple check the values on all the caps and solder them in the correct spots. Give yourself a pat on the back for completing the 20 meter module. You can use the same process for the other modules you want to build. Just be sure to follow the assembly manual component list for each band module. In part two I will cover the build process for the main PCB of the digital transceiver. It has a couple of bifiler transformers to wind, but they are easy compared to the toroid coils you've already done. There is one surface mount integrated circuit that is a little tough to solder if you've never done one before, but I will show you how. Until then, don't forget, I'm not Chuck.